Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to this parallel session on hospital systems improvement and operations efficiency. It's one of our 10 sessions under the hospital operations track of the first National Hospital Week Research Forum. So I'd like to acknowledge the attendance of our, um, our panel, of our presenters, and of our esteemed guests in this session. Um, as you may know, the call for abstracts for the research forum resulted in 212 submissions. These submissions underwent a stringent screening and selection process. In this session, we shall acquaint ourselves with three abstracts that successfully qualified for presentation. So congratulations to everyone here who is presenting today. Each of the uh, research presenters in this session shall have 15 minutes to present their papers. After, we will allot 10 minutes to answer questions from the audience. The audience will be on mute during the entire session. The audience can post their questions on the chat panel of the virtual session room. And the chat panel or the Q&A, uh, the chat panel can be accessed through the button at the bottom of the screen. Only one question per presenter will be answered live, but you can keep posting questions through the chat panel. Please identify the presenter you wish to ask, um, and then the question next. All questions posted will be included in the documentation of this activity. So later on, before we close the session, we will have a synthesis of the presentations and some um, announcements on the forum program. So just to introduce the presenters that we'll be having in this session. Um, they are the following. So that's. First is Dr. Charlon Kabebe from Batangas Medical Center, presenting their paper titled Contributing Factors for the Cancellation of Elective Surgeries in a Tertiary Government Hospital, a Retrospective Study. Next, we'll have Dr. Dute Ann Ross Bahong Dalang from Batangas Medical Center as well, presenting their paper titled Analysis of Turnaround Time for Surgical Pathology Specimen. And third, Dr. Georgia Antoinette Fermo from Zamboanga City Medical Center presenting their paper titled Burnout and Job Satisfaction Among Healthcare Providers at the Zamboanga City Medical Center. So to our researchers, thank you for joining this forum and congratulations again for making it this far into the initiative. So without further ado, let's begin with the presentation of Dr. Charlon Cabeva. You have the floor. Okay, well. So good afternoon. I am uh, Dr. Charlon Ikabebe, Medical Officer 4 from Batangas Mentis Medical Center, presenting my research about contributing factors for cancellation of elective surgeries in a tertiary ho government hospital, a retrospective study. So elective surgery cancellation is defined as elective cases in the operating theater listed and scheduled that were unintentionally deferred or canceled for various reasons. So elective surgery cancellation by any reason results in psychosocial, socioeconomic, and general physical effects that are damaging to the patients. Moreover, cancellation will result, will result in waste of valuable resources important to run a tertiary health care facility. Resources of tertiary care facilities requires the services of healthcare professionals from multiple disciplines, valuable devices, and instruments, and their running cost is in millions. So postponement, cancellation, or even changes in operative plans can result in waste of resources, hence such, such wastage could be damaging to doctors, the hospital, and to the patients. Next slide po. Patients who are left waiting for hours to get operated on might get annoyed when their surgeries end up being postponed. These might also include operations that require repetitive preoperative preparation. Most studies have found that surgical reasons such as overbooked theater lists or cases taking longer than expected were the main reasons. In Batangas Medical Center, records show that 157 cases were canceled in 2018, while 162 cases were canceled in 2019. However, the exact reasons as well as the rates of cancellations are unknown. Therefore, this gap in information warranted an investigation. Next slide. In view of possible economic losses, it is important to understand what factors might contribute to cancellation of surgeries to avoid waste and find ways to effectively utilize resources. In a developing country, 
40% of the total cost associated with clinical care was incurred in the operating room with daily cost for providing services amounting to approximately 382,000 Philippine pesos. Developed countries such as the United States had rates of canceled surgery with an equivalent waste resources amounting to 71,000 to 101,000 Philippine pesos per hour. The unique target of surgical interventions is to promote and develop health and well-being of the patient. Therefore, surgical cancellations could negatively impact the patients and relatives, as well as the hospital personnel causing stress for the patient and his or her companions. Patients may have to adjust their schedules just to accommodate a given date of surgery, take an unpaid leave from their respective work, and or arrange for childcare and travel expenses. The economic, social, and psychological impact on the patients should not be underestimated because these can result in disappointment among patients and their relatives. In one study from England, there has been reports of a significant health-related anxiety associated with a longer wait for surgery as patients may fear that their situation may deteriorate if surgical intervention has not been done. Although the impact of surgical cancellations involves primarily the hospital and the patient, the healthcare team are also affected on this situation. Among those mostly affected are the anesthesiologists and nurses. Studies have shown experiences with feelings of shame, sadness, and frustration related to cancellation of scheduled procedures since they are the ones who prepared, evaluate, and notify the patients. Next slide. Elective surgery cancellations are a wor worldwide problem with accolated data varying from 0.37 to 28% in developed countries and from 11 to 44% in developing countries. The leading cause for cancellation were non-fitness for surgery, surgical plan changes, lack of operation time, logistical reasons, and incomplete patient data. Analysis of data revealed that the majority of this, these factors can be prevented. Next slide. General objective, to determine the causes of cancellations of elective surgery noted at Batangas Medical Center from January 1, 2018 to December 31, 2019, with specific objectives to determine the socio-demographic characteristic as to the age of the patient, the sex, and the civil status. Next slide. To determine the clinical and anesthesia-related characteristics of phases of elective surgery cancellation as to the BMI comorbid conditions, ASA category and type of surgery, and to determine the hospital-related, surgeon-related, patient-related, and anesthesiologist-related factors that contribute to elective surgery cancellation. Next slide. So this is a retrospective research design. So collect collection of data regarding canceled elective surgeries. So using uh, utilizing operating room log books and medical records of patients admitted and discharged at Batangas Medical Center, male and Phili female Filipino patients in the pediatric to geriatric age groups who are residents of Batangas City or nearby localities were included. So the patients included in the present study were those admitted for elective surgery, but for some reasons were canceled. So inclusion and uh, exclusion criteria, ex inclusion all elective non-obstetrical surgical cases and canceled surgical cases, Exclusion criteria patients administered with local anesthesia by the surgeon alone without anesthesiologists. So all medical charts of canceled elective surgery cases with incomplete information. Next slide. So Batangas Medical Center is a 500 bed capacity training institution that is located in Region 4A Calabar Zone. So cases of canceled elective surgeries from January 1 to December 31, 2019 were identified using the operating room proposal logbook. Total enumeration of all canceled elective surgeries was used with the aim of obtaining the uh, largest number of cases of canceled elective surgery procedures. So on average, there is a 17.2% of all admitted patients in the period between 2015 and 2019 at Batangas Medical Center that had undergone surgery. So during the collection of data, it was noted that some patients tagged by nurses and documented in the operating room logbook as scheduled for an elective case were actually emergency cases. So upon rechecking among the 374 patients originally tagged as canceled elective surgeries, 55 were actually emergency cases. Hence, there were only 319 or 4.97% of actual elective surgeries canceled for various reasons. 
So most of the patients whose elective surgeries were canceled were in 41 to 59 age group and married and married. Cancellation rates were almost equal for both females and males. And females and males. So most of patients with canceled elective surgeries had normal BMI. Those with overweight BMI accounted for 25.71% of patients, while those with underweight BMI accounted for 14.11%. Most of the patients with 57.68% with canceled elective surgeries were ASA Category 2 or those with at least one comorbid condition. This group was followed by normal, healthy, or ASA 1 category patients and ASA 3 category patients. So most patients whose elective surgeries, uh, most of patients whose elective surgeries were canceled did not have any comorbidities. Hypertension and diabetes mellitus were the predominant comorbidities with 17 and 5% respectively. Multiple comorbidities were noted in 5 out of 319 patients with canceled elective surgeries. General, general surgery uh, accounted for most of the canceled elective procedures. This is followed by orthopedics and either neurosurgery or urology. The specialties with least rates of canceled elective procedures were ENT and ophthalmology. Next slide. So the reasons for cases of elective surgery cancellation were mostly patient-related at 40%. Hospital-related factors accounted for 30% of cancellations, while surgeon-related factors were 23.51%. There were no anesthesiologist-related factors noted in this study. In this study. Of the patient-related factors being not fit for surgery accounted for most reasons for cancellations, followed by having abnormal laboratory results and having incomplete patient data and workup. As with the hospital-related factors, the lack of operation time accounted by most of cancellations. Other factors were lack of instruments and lack of medical supplies. Regarding surgeon-related factors, the change of surgical plans accounted for most of cancellations. Other reasons were the non-availability of surgeon and clinical disagreement. Next slide. So a total of 6,420 patients were scheduled for elective surgery during the study period and 319 or 4.97% has been canceled due to various reasons. So the highest cancellation rate was the lack of operation time, which is hospital related at 32.29%. So patient classified under not fit to surgery, patients with hypertensive episode, ECG changes, belong to the second highest reason at 16.30%, which is patient-related. Next slide. Patient classified under not fit to surgery, okay. clinical and anesthesia-related characteristics with higher surgery cancellation rates include patients with normal BMI, low comorbidities, and AS2, ASA2 category. Amongst canceled surgeries, most cancellations were made by surgery and orthopedics. Next slide po. Next slide. Conclusion, the factors that led to cancellation of elective surgeries were mostly patient-related, followed by hospital-related factors and surgeon-related factors. Of the patient-related factors, being not fit for surgery accounted for most of cancellation. Being unfit for surgery is a major related factor for cancellation of elective surgery. Therefore, the patient's uh, ASA category status and having at least one comorbidity were major reasons for cancellation. Next slide. Hospital-related factors, particularly the lack of operation time accounted by most of the cancellations. Among the surgery-related factors, the change of surgical plans accounted for most of cancellations. And again, no anesthesiologist-related factors were noted. So, um... Next slide, for the recommendations and policy implications. So based on the results of the pres present study, the following recommendations for the conduct of future studies to validate and clarify the observed low cancellation rate using a prospective approach. So quantify the relationship between ASA status as well as presence of at least one comorbidity and rate of cancellation of elective surgeries. Determine, next slide, determine whether Optimizing the fitness of patient does have an impact on the reduction of cancellation rates of elective surgeries and determine the contribution of in-between surgery delays 
and unanticipated longer operative times to cancellation of elective surgeries. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Cabebe, for your wonderful um, presentation. Apologies to our audience as well for that technical difficulty that we had earlier. So if you have any questions, please post your questions for the, at the Q&A panel or in the chat panel on the site. And we will continue with the second um, presentation to be delivered by Dr. Dulce and Ross Bahong de Lain. So you have the floor, Dr. The two most powerful warriors are patience and time. A pleasant day, everyone. I am Dr. Bakong Dalangin, here to present our analysis of turnaround time for surgical pathology specimen. Turnaround time, or TAT, is measured in working days from specimen received to the time the report is made available to the clinician. Shorter TAT expedites diagnosis, facilitates early patient discharge, and reduces unnecessary hospital expenditures. Hence, Timeliness, which is expressed as TAT, is often used by clinicians as key indicator for laboratory performance. Surgical specimen may be classified into three. First, a standard routine specimen, which requires nothing more than the standard tissue processing and standard histologic examination of H and E stain sections. Second, as biopsy specimens. And finally, as complex specimen, which includes specimen from magical, major surgical procedures. There is currently limited local literature regarding TAT for surgical specimen, and most researches were conducted internationally. In 2012, the College of American Pathologists, or CAP, conducted a multi-institutional Q-probe study, which enlisted 2,763 complex specimens from 56 institutions. The sad Q-probe study reported the mean TAT for complex specimen to be 2.72 calendar days. Special handling cases had a median TAT of 4.13 days. Longer TAT occurred in government institutions with median TAT of 6.06 .06 versus 2.13 days in private institutions. In 2019, the CAP published a qualified clinical data registry measure for TAT of biopsy specimen. They conducted two separate studies to determine the percentage of final pathology reports that were signed out in two working days. The first study recorded 86% of biopsy specimens signed out by the second working day and 88% of biopsy reports received by surgeons on the fourth working day. In the second study, 80% of complex specimen, 90% of routine cases, and 60% of special handling cases were signed out in two days. In 2013, the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia outlined key performance indicators in pathology. Two of the identified KPI were the overall histopathology reporting TAT and diagnostic biopsy TAT. The RCPA recommended that 90% of all histopathology and diagnostic cytology cases be electronically available to the requester within 10 days of resection procedure. Additionally, the RCPA recommended that 90% of all biopsy cases should be electronically available to the requester within seven days. Overall, surgical pathology reports must be made available to the clinician as follows. 80% of specimen within five working days, 90% within 10 working days, and 98% within 15 working days. While the tap q probe study aimed to establish benchmark TAT for surgical specimen, it recognized various practice characteristics differing from one institution to another. Guided by the benchmarks established by the cap q probe study, each institution was encouraged to establish its own TAT goals according to the laboratory's capability and the needs of clinical departments. Hence, we arrived at the following objectives for this research. Generally, to compare the bat mc TAT for surgical specimen and the cap q probe TAT benchmark values. Specifically, first, to compare the bat mc mean TAT across specimen types. To compare the bat mc TAT against the cap q probe TAT according to specimen type. And to determine the difference in TAT according to the number of special procedures performed. As to the methodology, an analytic cross-sectional study design was employed from 2019 to 2020 at the Batangas Medical Center Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. Included in this study population are all standard routine specimen, biopsy specimen, and complex specimen received at the laboratory. Frozen sections, cytology specimen, and Papa Nicolaou smears were all excluded. The methodology procedure of the study is shown in this figure. For the study period, a total of 6,582 specimens were received from the inpatient and outpatient departments. 
After systematic random sampling and applying the ex exclusion criteria, a total of 297 standard routine specimen, 297 biopsy specimen, and 336 complex specimen were enrolled in the study. This is the specimen tracker form being utilized in the laboratory, indicating the date and time the specimen was received and the sub-processes it undertook until a final report was made available. From the tracker form, TAT was calculated and consolidated for statistical analysis. As part of ethical considerations, the privacy of the patient's personal information was treated as highly confidential. The following statistical methods were used to analyze the data. SPSS version 26 was used. Mean, median, and standard deviation were used to determine the TAT for surgical specimen. One way, ANOVA, was used to determine if there is significant differences in mean TAT based on specimen type and the number of special procedures performed. Two key post hoc tests was used to determine which among the specimen type and among number of procedures had significant differences in the mean TAT. One sample median test was used to compare bat mc tat with the cap probe stat benchmark values. We now go to the results and discussion. Surgical specimen were classified into three, standard routine specimen, biopsy specimen, and complex specimen. The top three for the standard routine specimen are vermiform appendices, placental tissues from completion curettage, and fallopian tubes from tubal ligation. Biopsy specimen included in the study were mostly gynecologic cases, 37% consisting of cervical and endometrial curettage, vulvar, and, and vaginal biopsy. Breast mass biopsy and colorectal biopsy each contributed 12% to all biopsy cases analyzed. Likewise, majority of large complex specimens were OB gynecologic cases from major, major procedures, accounting for 34%. Specimen from mastectomy and colon resection accounted for 12% and 7% of cases respectively. After exploration of data, the following results were obtained. Table 1A shows the comparison of mean TAT according to specimen types. Standard routine specimen registered a mean TAT of 2.62 days. Biopsy specimen had mean TAT of 3.29 days, while complex specimen registered 4.32 days as mean TAT, with p-value below 0 0.001. A significant difference in the mean TAT across the three specimen types were observed, with complex specimen recording the longest mean TAT and standard routine specimen registering the shortest time. Post hoc analysis was used to compare each specimen type to the other two shown in table 1B. With a p-value below 0 0.001, significant differences in the mean TAT were noted. For instance, in the first row, the mean TAT of standard routine specimen was significantly lower compared to that of biopsy specimen and complex specimen, and so on. These findings were comparable to the results seen in other related studies. The CAPQ probe cited that prolonged TAT of complex specimen was associated with detailed grossing and examination. Moreover, complex specimen usually re required adequate fixation to add at least one day to the overall turnaround time. On the other hand, biopsy and standard routine specimen were often fixed immediately after they arrived at the laboratory and were immediately processed. Several TAT audits conducted in various laboratory facilities reported similar observations with large complex specimens having the longest TAT. Table 2A shows that there was a statistically significant difference between bat MC TAT for standard routine specimen, which was 2.7 days, and the CAPQ probe TAT of 2 days. The same was observed in bat MC's biopsy specimen with a median TAT of 3.04 days. Therefore, but MC specimen had increased median TAT compared to the CAPQ probes, and the differences were statistically significant. Moreover, only 34% of BAT MC's standard routine specimen and 15% of biopsy specimen were signed out in two days or less. This percentage is markedly below the results of the CAP QCDR measure, which recorded 85% of routine cases signed out in just two days. As for complex specimen, table 2B displayed the comparison of bat mc tat to two cap q probe benchmarks. Median TAT for all institutions, 2.72 days, and median TAT for government institutions. 
6.06 days. One sample median test reflected statistically significant difference in the TAT values. The BAT MC median TAT being longer than that reported for all institutions, but shorter than that of government institutions. It can be derived that BAT MC TAT for complex specimen is better than that of government institutions included in the CAP QPROBE study. However, it did not meet the recommended TAT for all institutions. For further illustration, this figure reflected the cumulative percentage of complex specimens that were signed out on a given day after the specimen was accessioned at bat -MC Laboratory. Only 8% of complex specimens were signed out in two days, 24% in three days, 17% in six days, 80% in seven days, and by the ninth day, 94% of complex specimen was signed out. Similar to standard routine and biopsy specimens, percentages were lower compared to the CAP QCDR measure published in 2019, which recorded 80% of complex specimens signed out in two days, and 60% of those with special procedures were signed out in two days. Elaborating on the special procedures, that were performed, this study further analyzed the impact of these procedures in the overall TAT. Of the 300 plus large complex specimen analyzed in this study, 54% had undergone special procedures. Intradepartmental referral was the most common special procedure performed in 54% of all complex specimens, followed by review of operative report and clinical records and decalcification. Review of clinical records and operative report ranks second in the most commonly performed special procedure. The impact on that greatly depended on the availability of clinical data on the requisition form. Comparison of mean TAT according to the number of special procedures performed is illustrated in tables 3A and B. Statistical analysis showed that conduct of special procedures impacted the mean TAT. Compared to the mean TAT of all complex specimens, those without special procedures had shorter mean TAT of 3.69 days. That is for those without special procedures. An increase in TAT was observed when one special procedure was performed here, 4.67 days, and as predicted, longer TAT was seen in specimen with two special procedures done. Table 3B illustrates that differences in mean TAT were determined to be statistically significant by two key post hoc tests. There was a trend of increasing TAT with increasing number of special procedures performed. These are the probable factors which may explain longer TAT as cited on related studies. Q probes reported longer TAT in government institutions attributed to staffing patterns, extent of automation, and high volume of specimen. Bed capacity greater than 450 and pre presence of residency training were likewise identified as contributing factors. Laboratory information system or LIS was widely used in other institutions to manage patient data and clinical information. LIS could potentially, potentially reduce the overall TAT by eliminating steps involving repeated manual data entry. Division clinical information in the requisition form and special procedures may also prolong turnaround time. In conclusion, this study documented that TAT for three surgical specimen types received at BAT-MC. Significant differences in mean TAT across the three specimen types were identified. BAT-MC standard routine specimen and biopsy specimen had statistically significant higher median TAT than benchmark recommended by the CAPQ probe study. Median TAT of BAT MC complex specimen is longer than crew probes median TAT for all institutions, but shorter than that of government institutions. Increasing number of special handling procedures resulted in corresponding increase in mean turnaround time. We recommend the following first for the hospital. Establish LIS at BAT MC DPLM, full automation or increase in manpower, provision of complete and concise clinical information, availability of special procedures, and develop a standardized procedure and policy for DOH hospitals. And for future researches, we want to evaluate at which subprocesses that is significantly prolonged, investigate how other factors influence that, and how each special procedure impacts the overall turnaround time. 
Thank you very much for lending your ears and here are my references. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Rahman Bilani. So congratulations on your presentation. Um, again, we remind everybody, if you have any questions, you can post it in the chat panel on the site. So finally, let's proceed with our third presenter to be delivered by Dr. Georgia Antoinette Fairman. Dr. you have the floor. countries. However, there is paucity of information in underdeveloped countries like the Philippines, wherein studies were limited among nurses and physicians. The Zamboanga City Medical Center is a tertiary government hospital that caters to a number of patients throughout the region and nearby provinces. Current expansion of infrastructures and medical facilities entails provision of healthcare services to a growing population. Therefore, increasing pressure and workload demand among its employees, which can lead to burnout. In fact, few local studies conducted in the institution last 2008 by Dr. Abutasil and Dr. Carrido in 2018 were limited to commonly studied occupational groups, such as doctors, nurses, and nursing attendants, which revealed prevalence of burnout in this group of health workers. For this reason, the researcher was compelled to determine the prevalence of burnout and job satisfaction among healthcare providers of various occupational groups employed at the Sambuanga City Medical Center. As suggested by Ruiz and Santos in 2007, further studies must be done in order to measure the real frequency of burnout in our country. This study generally aims to determine the prevalence of burnout and job satisfaction among healthcare providers at the Zamboanga City Medical Center. Specifically, the study aims to determine the prevalence of burnout, identify dimensions of burnout, determine the proportion of satisfied healthcare providers, and to identify facets of job satisfaction among healthcare providers at the Zamboanga City Medical Center. The study utilized a descriptive cross-sectional design. Multi-stage random sampling was used in the selection of respondents. Firstly, healthcare providers were stratified according to the four major divisions of services, which include medical, nursing, hospital operations, and patient support and finance service. Secondly, respondents were randomly selected from each division. Those who met the criteria and agreed to participate were included in the study. The sample population from each of the four major services were computed based on sampling proportional to size. A minimum of 360 respondents was required in the study. The sample size was computed using estimation of single proportion with prevalence of burnout of 36.7% based on the study done by Bixen et al. in 2016, with a confidence interval of 95% and 5% margin of error. A total of 362 employees of various occupational groups participated in the study. A self-administered questionnaire was employed to gather data, which comprise of social demographic data, questions from the Copenhagen Burnout Inventory, and Job Satisfaction Scale. Analysis and presentation of results were done using descriptive statistics, such as frequency and percentages. Based on the findings in Table 1, the prevalence of burnout among healthcare providers was about 23.49%, while 76.52% had no burnout. Majority, around 38.68% of the respondents belong to the 31 to 40 age groups with a female predominance. Most of them were married and more than 60% graduated from college. In addition, around 59.4% 
had been employed in the current institution for one to five years. Nurses were found to have the highest rate of burnout of about 38.83%, followed by doctors with 24% and administrative staffs with approximately 13%. The prevalence of burnout in this study is relatively higher compared with similar local studies carried out in the same institution. The probable reason for the difference is that this study utilized the Copenhagen Burnout Inventory Tool, which is different from the tool used by previous studies. A larger sample size with inclusion of various occupational groups of health care providers were included in this study, which may have resulted to a higher prevalence of burnout. Table 2 summarizes the dimensions of burnout among healthcare providers. It is worth noting that the prevalence of personal burnout was found to be higher than the overall burnout status with approximately 33%. It was found to be predominant among those who belong to the medical division. Whereas work and client-related burnout were common among those who belong to the nursing unit. Personal burnout could be related to factors such as personal conflicts, stressful life events, and family work conflict. In addition, one identified personal factor could be lack of exercise. It was revealed in a study among family medicine resident trainees that those who do not exercise have four times the risk of having burnout as compared to those who have regular exercise. Health workers with no self-efficacy, which refers to a person who has poor evaluation of oneself, who has inadequate training, and poor perception of skills were found to be associated with burnout. Overall, as shown in Table 3, approximately 48.35% of healthcare providers were satisfied with their current jobs. Only 1.66% were dissatisfied while majority were ambivalent. Job ambivalence has shown to moderate the relationship between job satisfaction and job performance in a study by Sigler et al. in 2012. The study showed that individuals who experienced low job ambivalence had higher job satisfaction as compared to individuals who experienced high job ambivalence. Hence, it is imperative that employees must be satisfied and not just ambivalent towards their job. Majority of those who claim to be satisfied with their jobs belong to the 31 to 40 age groups. Most of them were females, married, and have been employed for one to five years. Most of the satisfied respondents belong to the medical and nursing division. Majority were physicians, which comprised of medical specialists and medical officers who reported overall job satisfaction followed by nurses nursing attendants, and midwives. Also, about 50% of administrative staff, in particular officers and assistants, claim to be satisfied with their current jobs. Furthermore, the study revealed that among six out of nine facets of job satisfaction, more than 50% of the respondents claim to be satisfied with nature of work with approximately 80.39% followed by supervision, co-workers, communication, and pay. Nature of work refers to the task of a job that an employee must perform. Thus, it is imperative that healthcare providers find their jobs enjoyable and find meaning in the work that they do, because this could affect the quality of health services they provide. Further, while majority of the respondents reported satisfaction with fringe benefits, they constitute less than half of the respondents. This facet refers to both non-monetary and monetary benefits that an employee receives. This could imply that despite working in a public hospital where benefits are thought to be superior than its private counterpart, many were still unsatisfied with the benefits they receive. Dissatisfaction or ambivalence in this facet may lead to having second thoughts of leaving an organization and search for a new job with a more satisfying benefits. On the other hand, about 44% claim to be dissatisfied with their working condition. Approximately 42% and 
and 47.5% claim to be ambivalent with regards to promotion and contingent rewards, respectively. In summary, the study revealed a 23.49% prevalence of burnout among CCMC employees. Majority had personal burnout, followed by work-related and client-related burnout. Moreover, around 48.35% reported job satisfaction. In particular, a great percentage were satisfied with the nature of their work, followed by supervision, communication, co-worker, pay, and fringe benefits. The results of this study showed prevalence of burnout across occupational groups. In addition, only less than half of the respondents reported job satisfaction, which could indicate that the prevalence of satisfied employees was low. Hence, it is recommended that health administrators must immediately take action to address this concern. Measures to promote mental health and increase job satisfaction among its employees must be made, especially among vulnerable groups, such as nurses, doctors, nursing attendants, and administrative assistants. It is also recommended to explore on the possible factors which may have resulted to a great percentage of respondents who reported dissatisfaction on their working conditions and ambivalence on contingent rewards and promotion. This could further assist in the development of strategies to promote job satisfaction among healthcare providers. Thank you for your kind attention. All right. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Fermo. So again, I'd like to thank all of our present presenters for their wonderful presentations. Um, now we'd like to hear the questions from our audience. So our coordinator, Ms. JJ, has monitored the chat panel and um, selected at least one question for each of the presenters to answer. So for our first question, Ms. Hiko, can you be the one? Thank you very much. For Dr. Kabebe. Hello. Spo, good afternoon, Spo. Uh, for Dr. Kabebe, the question is, did you consider binary logistic regression aside from just descriptive result of the factors listed? Uh, to answer the question, po, um, um, so, totoo lang po, I am not a statistician, so I am not familiar with the binary logistic regression po. So, the study is just uh, purely descriptive. So, umikot lang po siya dun sa question na what are the factors contributing to cancellation of uh, elective surgeries po. Thank you po. Okay, thank you, Doc. For Dr. Rabakong Dalangin, the question is, uh, were you able to identify the specific bottlenecks in the different procedures? And did you consider doing process flow analysis uh, in operations management? Uh, good afternoon po. So, uh, one, of, what, one of the problems that we identified is the intradepartmental referral. So, uh, isa po yun sa pagmimitingan po namin actually in our department, probably we would want to increase the number of consultants per day para po mabilis po yung maging turnaround time of our specimens. Yun naman po yung isa talaga sa purpose po rin ng study na to, so as to improve po yung operations po namin sa anatomic pathology in BAT-MC. Thank you po. Okay. Thank you. Thank you po, Dr. For everyone uh, in our session, do you have any question po for Dr. Fermo regarding her research po? You can type in your question po sa Q&A button po. Thank you. Another have a question po for Dr. Fermo. Um, you mentioned, ma'am, that the, um, a study similar to this already was done in uh, CCMC, diba? pero they always left out um, other healthcare workers or from various occupations. What was the motivation for you to include them? Or um, would you know the motivation prior kung bakit po MDs and nurses lang yung ini-include madalas sa studies? Mm -hmm. 
Um, good afternoon po. Uh, I included other occupational groups po ma'am kasi um, even international studies would only, only mention nurses and doctors. And I have found that in uh, a few studies that I have read, uh, in include po nila yung ibang occupational groups and they, they were found to have also burnout po. That's the reason po why I um, included uh, other occupational groups. Yun lang po. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, I have a follow up. Lang. Um, I just ask, um, um, do you think there was parang mas po yung data if if you have um I'm I'm, I'm very glad po that you included yung uh, mga admin assistants no because we saw that they had high levels of burnout as well so um yes agree with you that I don't normally see them in the study so I'm grateful for that but um do you think there was an effect on 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 your data itself na parang pwedeng mag skew siya or mabawasan yung yung effect niya because you had a mix of both um, uh, patient direct healthcare workers and none? Um, I don't think ma'am na naka to yun sa result ng, ng study ko kasi basically po um, healthcare providers as defined in my study po would include um, all the occupational groups working in a in a hospital po and uh, the the tool that i used was not only for um medical health workers po but can also be used among non medical staff po ma'am sorry last question po from um one of our audience um what was the basis though for your sample size um used in your study um, I computed po, ma'am, yung sample size ko based on a previous study, as I have mentioned by Bixen et al. Uh, the prevalence of burnout in his study was 36.7%. So, uh, I based it from there po. Tapos, kinumpute ko po siya, ma'am. Right. Thank you very much po, ma'am, no, for, for answering our questions and to all of our presenters for um, your presentations and for answering the questions from the audience. Um, so that's all the time we have for our panel session on hospital systems improvement and operations efficiency of the hospital operations track of the first national hospital research forum. So just like to make an announcement, we make um, we'd like you to be able to log on to your next parallel session on time. So um, we're actually a little bit late, but it's okay. Um, as some of you know, there are 30 papers out of 60 being presented in this forum that are being considered ready for best research. So um, the winners will be announced and awarded at the closing plenary session for the forum of oral. So quickly, I'll just make um, a short synthesis. No? So in the session, we were able to hear about the various factors related to the cancellation of elective surgeries relevant to the resources of organizations and hospitals and overall surgical care. We also saw how the bat mc that benchmarking with a CAPQ probe stat and recognized the probable factors of prolonging that in, in bad MC. And on the other hand, we also saw the prevalence of burnout among various occupational groups employed in ZCMC. So these various dimensions of burnout and the prevalence of job satisfaction in the same group gave us an insight up to um, the current status of our healthcare workers, both administrative and healthcare um, direct patient facing as well. So. Again, I'd like to thank all of you for your participation today in our uh, part one of the forum. So we'd like to have a 10 minute break before starting the next parallel session uh, on patient safety and infection prevention and control. And we're also announcing that the link to the post activity evaluation form will be a, will be announced and posted and all those who will be able to fill them up. Um, the online post activity eval form 
to receive a certificate of attendance and return. So this parallel session has been concluded. And thank you again for your participation. We hope to see you all at the closing and awarding ceremony. So again, congratulations to all of our presenters. All very wonderful research has done, especially in this time of pandemic. So um, congratulations again, and thank you for your participation.